Good evening, and welcome to Beware of Spoilers. I am Adam. I debated putting the Ant-Man theme in from, what's it called, from the other episode we've done, 30-minute reviews, which is that fucking ridiculous TV spot that uh, Michael Douglas and Paul Rudd did for the first Ant-Man, where they're just slapping each other and slapping themselves and saying ants over and over again with increasing ferocity. Um, But I forgot to put it on my phone. Um, and I was going to do that, but also I, um, I was going to record it on my laptop, but I saw the movie at 6.30, and let me just say, if there's a trailer you're trying to avoid, maybe just wholesale skip seeing Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, because they're going to show every fucking trailer for a movie coming out in the next six months, so just get ready for that, um, because I, I, it was a 6 o'clock showing, uh, or a 6.30 showing, and... I stayed through the whole credits, the whole two hours and 11 minutes, including post-credit and all of that, um, and I am just now getting out, and it is now 9.07, um, so let's just be, you know, realistic about this, they're showing every fucking movie you can possibly imagine, but I will say this, I did get really hyped for, of all things, Mario, after seeing that Mario trailer, um, I was not expecting that. But uh, it did it, it did hit pretty well, that Mario trailer, uh, seeing it on the big screen. And what was the other one? There was another one, too, that I was like, oh, shit. Um, that looks really cool in 3D. Guardians. Guardians is going to be on some, other, some next level shit. And you know what actually did a little bit more for me this time than it did watching it uh, during the Super Bowl? The Flash. The Flash did a lot more for me watching the trailer this time. Um, but we're not here to talk about trailers. That's not what we're here here to talk about. And I'm going to play the spoiler warning right now. The title of the show is Beware of Spoilers. We're talking about a movie that came out today. This should not need to be explicitly stated, but there will be spoilers beyond this point. So please do not get mad at me if I spoil the movie for you, because I'm giving you a pretty solid warning that I will be spoiling this movie as I talk about it. Um, There has been a good amount of... Not griping. I feel like griping is the wrong word. Um, the, the issue I have, I, I saw a lot of, I, I did read the reviews before I went to see this movie, which is not something I normally do. Ordinarily, if I were to go see a movie, I try to go in blind somewhat, um, so that way my opinion is not, you know, sullied by what other people are saying. If I do anything, I will look, because usually you'll get an article that's like, here is the initial Rotten Tomatoes score for, insert movie here. And I'll check that out to see, alright, so it's about, like, you know, whatever it is. This is at a 51, and I was like, really? 51, and let's see what it is about this movie that makes it a 51, because now I'm, now I'm curious. And maybe it is the Batman v Superman effect, where if you, if you listen back to Peter and I's review of Batman v Superman, if it's up on the screen still, I don't know if it is, but when that movie came out, it had a 29 on Rotten Tomatoes, and we were both like, holy shit, like, this movie's gonna be awful, and then we went into it, and we were like, it's not that bad. It's not great. Don't get me wrong. It's not a great movie. Batman v Superman is by no stretch of the imagination great. And you can make the case that it's not good either. But it's not that bad. And it was kind of the movie that made us question the binary system of good or bad when it came to Rotten Tomatoes. But it's the kind of thing where it's like, I kind of went into this like, oh, okay, you know, maybe it's not that great. Or maybe it is going to be like Eternals, where it's like, I diverge greatly from where critics were on this. And watching this movie once, I can't exactly understand where a lot of the vitriolic... I mean, look, the, the, the first half and the second half of the movie feel like very different movies. Um, the first half has a little bit more of a Alice in Wonderland kind of vibe to it, while the second half is kind of, you know, that one episode of Andor where they're breaking out of prison and you're like... Like, that was the thing, is like... And I think that that's definitely something that is impacting my viewing of it, is having just seen that done on Andor... Seeing this here now is making me question how good this is in comparison, because it's really not nearly as good as Andy Serkis giving his monologue to get able to escape from the Imperial prison colony. Um, but, I mean, look, that's comparing apples to oranges at this point. Um, I, I, I was looking forward to this movie to a pretty for a pretty solid degree, because I was like, look, this is going to be giving us something going forward. We didn't get a ton of that in Phase 4, and I think that that was part of what people didn't like about Phase 4. And I I talk to people about it every once in a while, and the thing that should be addressed is um, Phase 1 is 
Act 1 of the story, Phase 2 of Act 2 of the story, Phase 3 of Act 3 of the story. We're now back at, ostensibly, what would be Phase 1 um, with Phase 4. Where we have to regroup, reestablish who's who, reestablish who is here, and able to partake in the story, where they are in regards to this story, and then go from there. So it's it's a it's a kind of a tall order for a movie. It's a lot for 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 it, and especially for audience who are coming off of the high, so to speak, of where it was. It, it it's a lot for an audience to adjust to. It's getting back to this, you know, this old method of you know kind of telling the story, and I think that that's kind of where we are right here. Um, and now with phase two, we're starting to build more toward. Um, What's it called? Trying to build more toward, um, you know, where we are in phase, you know, what's it called? In phase, uh, in, in going forward in the multiverse saga with with Kang the Conqueror as the as the bad guy. And let me just say, Kang in this movie is probably the strongest part of it. Um, Jonathan Majors is great. I lo- like. I, I went back and watched the finale of Loki the other day, and I think Jonathan Majors really nails the role and does a great job with it. He's having a lot of fun. Um, I just think that we have this issue where um, the rest of the movie around him... I, I, and I think this is a problem going into it that really couldn't have been addressed by this movie. It is... Um, Kang is too big of a villain for Ant-Man. Um, to, for it to feel like Ant-Man... And, and, and to the movie's credit, Ant-Man does not really get a good hit in on, on Kang. It, I mean... He gets a, you know what it reminds me a little bit of? Especially the third act fight between Ant-Man and Kang. The final fight that happens between the two of them. It reminds me a lot of Tony Stark fighting um, Thanos on Titan in Infinity War. Where you get one or two good hits in. and he, you know, But he gets, a, he gets his ass kicked. Um, and, and, and I appreciate that. Uh, there are a few things in this movie that like you can kind of see the bones of where the previous movie that this was going to be was. Um... For example, I'm fairly certain, I think this is a pretty good bet, that had it not been for the fact that they were going to put this entire movie at the core of setting up the multiverse saga, um, they probably would have done, um, what's it called, they probably would have had MODOK be the bad guy. It would have been a similar plot, but MODOK being that role instead of Kang and Chronopolis and all of that. Um, but, like, man, just, that, like, the whole thing is just, like, fun the entire way through. It's, like, two hours and change, but you never really feel it, which is great. Um, especially considering how much exposition is given, like, toward the middle to really explain it. There are a few discontinuities that have a problem with, like, why was Janet okay with sending, um, with sending Scott into the quantum realm to collect the quantum ore for Ghost? when she knows Kang's down there and they don't want Kang to escape. Like, it, it feels like a big thing. Um, but it's just like, look, that, like, I, I feel like part of the problem with this whole interconnected universe thing, um, and not only that, I'm saying, like, it's a new thing. They've been doing it for, like, over a decade now. But not only that, but also branching between streaming and live action, uh, streaming and theatrical is... You have to re-explain things for people who don't know. And granted, I'll give this movie the benefit of the doubt because we do have a few scenes where uh, where Kang explains, you know, that there are other variants out there and all of that. There are there are scenes of that, and we do get a little bit of that, kind of like the finale of Loki, but they're not nearly as in depth. And I do appreciate that they didn't make people who would watch both sit through that. Um, but they do need to give you some to explain why this is a threat, what could happen, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and, and I appreciate that, too. Um, what else was there? I mean, look, I think that... I, I and, and the thing is, too, it's like the other issue that I, I've brought up in the past is... Um, like, in this movie, we have Scott do something that could potentially doom the universe where we get this really cool scene of Scott with all these other infinite Scots in the probability storm and all of that. It's a cool thing. Um, I I like that. Um, And it's Scott going and 
giving Kang the means to escape to save Cassie's life. And I think that one of the things that I've mentioned as a problem with Infinity War is that in Infinity War, when Peter Quill can't pull the trigger to kill Gamora, um, or later when he finds out Gamora's killed and starts punching Thanos in the face, I don't exactly buy that this is a love between these two characters that's worth the death of half of the universe. The fact that they can't be together is worth everyone else dying as a result. I don't... We, and, and that's not necessarily the fault of Infinity War for not doing that. It's the fault of the Guardians movies for not giving enough of that. Um, it's kind of the same... Like, you get that same thing here where it's like, Scott's gonna do that. But the difference is, you 100% buy that Scott would doom all of reality to save Cassie's life. Uh, and, and Catherine Newton's great. I, I, I really liked her addition. Um, I buy her as an older version of the little girl from the first two, uh, just in terms of kind of getting the personality similar and um, and just in terms of mannerisms and all that. I, I buy that, um, and that's great. Um, MODOK's pretty cool. Um, I, I do like how they did MODOK. And I, I, at first I was put off by weird, stretchy face Corey Stoll because it's like, it's a little weird to see um, on the screen. You're like, oh, that's uncomfortable looking because it's like, oh, it looks cartoony on top of everything else and not really real. But within the movie, it, like, I, I don't, like, they could have just kept them in the mask the whole time, but I feel like that would have, if they kept them in the mask the whole time, people would have bitched about it, so you have to kind of show his face. It, it, it's a no-win situation to use MODOK. Um, but whatever. And, and it's like, when, we, when we're introduced to MODOK, and then MODOK kidnaps Cassie and Scott and brings them to, um, brings them to, to Kang's lair, or Kang's citadel, like, we get the whole, like, his whole thing where he's explaining, like, oh, shit, like, you know, I want revenge for what you did to me. And I'm like, that would have been a good movie on its own. Maybe we don't need Kang here to do that. But I, I don't think that's necessarily a, a, a outright detriment to this movie. Um, what else was there that I wanted to address with this? Um, Bill Murray has a very small role in the movie. He's barely in it. Um, all the Quantum Realm designs are... I, I think the production design of this movie is just far and away one of, some of the most interesting production design we've gotten in a Marvel movie. Everything about the Quantum Realm is just so colorful and unique, and it all feels so, you know... Like, like they're taking full advantage of the fact that this is a unreal reality, and they're, they're using the most of it. Um, there are a few weird edit choices... Um, like at one point we see Kang talking to, to, to Janet, um, but then he's like, all right, I'm going to go now. And then he goes to leave. And then the next scene, he's standing on his platform in that trailer shot that we have from the first trailer. And it's like, all right, like that's a, that's a weird cut. I could have done without that. And then there was another one where it's like when Cassie and Scott first, first get kidnapped by, um, what's it called? First get kidnapped by, uh. Um, what's it called? Um, when Cassie shot first get kidnapped by the Freedom Fighters, um, it's like, Cassie's like, drink the goo, Scott, uh, drink, drink the goo, Dad. And it's like, is he hallucinating that, or what? Because then it's like, they cut away to a, to a, to a Hope and, uh, Hank and Janet thing, and then they come back, and he still hasn't drank the goo, and they're introducing what the goo is, and they're gonna have him drink it. And it's like, that, it, it feels a little weird. I, I wouldn't have gone with that if it was me. Um, I, I, I just, I, that, like, it, if that's the worst that the movie does, I mean, look, I, the, the quantum realm makes very little sense, but I don't think it was ever intended to make that much sense to begin with. It's meant to be this alternate reality that's kind of like, where, like, if time and space don't exist there, then I, I guess the rules of reality, I guess whatever we need it to do, it'll, it'll do for us, which, all right, fine, I can deal with that. Like, it does make, like, it, it makes sense in that it makes no sense, um, and, and I think that it does kind of work with that kind of well. Um, what else was there? Um, hmm, I feel like there's definitely other things that should be, that I should be talking about with this, but I can't really think of them. I mean, that post-credit scene is great. Um, it is the, the Thanos putting on the Infinity Gauntlet of, uh, at the end of Age of Ultron. And the other one is, you know, the Loki and, Mo and Mobius looking on at, you know, 
at a 1940s Tang is just so great. Everything about that is just so great. Like, the, the, this movie does its job. And it's like, if we, if we look at, like, what, what we look at a Marvel Studios movie to do, it's got to exist within the universe, it's got to set up stuff in the future, and it's got to stand alone on its own. It exists within the future, within the universe pretty well. It sets up stuff for the future fantastically well, where it makes me excited for, for Kang Dynasty and, and for other things going forward, including the possibility of, you know, maybe the Marvels ties into the multiverse. This didn't really think too much about the, um, what's it called, about, uh, with the, the other relics that we've seen so far, the, the, um, the bangles and, and the ten rings. But, you know, maybe the Marvels will deal more with that come, uh, what's it called, come, uh, July. And it, it makes me excited for that and all that. And then as a movie itself, I, I just feel like that's where the movie kind of falls the shortest, is serving its own plot. Um, the Cassie and Scott storyline works, but I feel like most of the others don't. Um, and I feel like a lot of that comes from, and I think it's a consistent issue across all of the Ant-Man movies... I don't think that Hope is written particularly well. And I know I sound like a million incels on the internet who, who are going to get mad about it. It's a woman, so we're going to say women aren't written well. Um, and I'm not saying overall. I'm saying specifically within movies. Um, they don't really have a rhyme or reason to her emotional arc a lot of the time. It's She's kind of just there to exposit the emotion needed in the moment and then move on. So, like, when we have her... Um, like, like the, the, the perfect example I give is in the first Ant-Man, where how she feels about Hank wildly varies depending on the scene. Uh, and then by, in this movie, we have a similar kind of situation where, you know, her relationship with, with Janet, it's complex. I'm not saying that it's not a complex relationship, but it does kind of feel like it oscillates quite a bit from scene to scene, and then it's kind of just dropped entirely. So when I say she's not well-written, I don't mean that she's not well-written in the sense that you know, she's not living up to my expectations. It's just, it, she's not given enough of an arc to really get a chance to grow. And I think the same, like, Hank is barely in the movie, and he doesn't really get much to do either. And it's kind of that problem where it's like these characters need more room to 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 do stuff. Um, essentially, this should have been called Ant-Man and Stature, Quantumania, or Ant-Man and Cassie, Quantumania, if we wanted, because they didn't call her Stature in the movie. But, like... If that's the case, then I feel like that's the, that what they probably should have done. Um, but there's enough in the movie to make it an entertaining experience, if only once. And, and I watched it in 3D. Just for something to keep in mind, the movie is shot on the volume, um, which is Lucasfilm's big, you know, virtual set. Um, and if you watch the movie in 3D, any time they use it, you can tell. Um, and I think it's kind of a problem they have to work out with this. It's kind of like we're looking at a new technology that in the initial use um, of the Mandalorian and all of that, um, it got a lot of praise because for the Mandalorian, you don't need to use it for very complex things. Now we're trying to use it for more complex things and it's not working properly. Um, so it, where scenes where they're standing in front of this, where it's supposed to like this vast, unending thing, like Avatar, you get the sense of scale and depth behind everything. You don't get that here. You get the sense that there is very clearly a wall behind them, and that's what this image is. Um, and I feel like that is kind of a problem with this movie, if, if we're going to get to that point. Um, but I think that's a good place to wrap up for today. Um, with Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. I, I would say it's not as bad as the Rotten Tomatoes score would indicate, although that, I think, is the case for most movies with Rotten Tomatoes, um, especially if you're going to talk about TV shows on Rotten Tomatoes. The, the Rotten Tomatoes score is not usually accurate on that. Um, I think the movie is perfectly serviceable. I would say it's a mid-tier Marvel movie. Um, probably high mid-tier, if it was up to me. I would say it's a high mid-tier Marvel movie. Um, where it, it's, I would say it's, hmm, it's better than most of Phase 4, um, but granted, also, you gotta take what I say with a grain of salt, because I, you know, mileage will vary, because I did also really like the Eternals, and a lot of people do not like the Eternals, so keep that in mind, um, but as I've said before, when it comes to movie reviews, um, 
if you're listening to a movie review, um, it's more for a discussion um, than it should be for anything like that. It's, it's to, to hear someone else talk about something uh, and to see how it lines up with your own feelings or anything like that. It's, it, you know, it, it, it's more about interpretation and stuff like that um, than it is about anything else. Um, and, and, and the thing is, movie reviews can be helpful if you find someone who aligns with how you view things. If you have someone who likes the same things you do, then their review is of value to you because you can trust their opinion. It's, you know, it's kind of different when it comes to, uh, what's it called, when it comes to, you know, the current state of things. But we'll wrap up there for today. So tomorrow morning we will have The Flash, Season 9, Episode 2. And until then, have a great rest of your week. Be sure to subscribe and give us five stars on iTunes because we talk about a lot of things and it's the easiest way to find out everything we're talking about. So until then, have a great rest of your week.